So thanks for coming. Um, we're here to talk about full disk encryption, why you're not really as secure as you might think you are. Oh, what just happened? I'm missing a slide. Okay, well, we'll just, I'll just say it, I'll just say what it was then. Um, so, how many of you encrypt the hard drives in your computer? Just like a show of hands. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, welcome to DEF CON. Uh, <laughs> so, I guess it's like what, 90% of you at least? Um, so, uh, how many of you use open source uh, full disk encryption software, something that you could potentially audit and, okay, not as many of you, um, like TrueCrypt or, you know? How many of you always fully shut down your computer uh, whenever you're leaving it unattended? Okay, more of you, I'd say about 20%. Uh, how many of you have ever left your computer unattended for more than a few hours? A lot of hands should be up. Either. Either on or off. <laughs> I mean, I'd be surprised if you're not because I'd have to ask, are you like zombies that don't sleep or something? Okay, and, and obvious, and then the other answer, of course, is anyone who leaves their computer unattended for more than a few minutes. Also, pretty much everyone. So, why do we encrypt our computers? Um, and it's surprisingly hard to find anyone actually talking about this, which is really weird. Um, and I think it's really important to articulate our motivations, why we are doing something, a particular security practice, um, to, and, and if we don't do that, we don't have a sensible um, goalpost to see how, we, how we're doing. Um, there's plenty of details in the documentation of full disk encryption software of what they do, what algorithms they use, uh, what, you know, how they're passing passwords and so forth, but almost nobody's talking about why. And I argue that we, wanted, we, we encrypt our computer because we want some control of our data, some uh, assurances about the confidentiality and integrity of our data, that nobody's stealing our data or modifying our data without us knowing about it. Um, and it's basically, we want, we want determination over our data. Uh, we want to, to be able to control what happens to it. And there's also uh, situations where you have liabilities for uh, not maintaining the secrecy of your data. Lawyers have to have uh, attorney-client privilege, doctors have patient confidentiality, um, people who are in finance and accounting have all sorts of uh, regulatory rules that they need to comply with. And so if you're leaking data, you know, there's companies which have to notify their customers that, oh, we've, someone left a laptop unencrypted in a van and it got broken into and stolen, so your data might be out there on the internet. Um, but it also speaks to, and, and it's, it's really all about uh, physical access to our computers that we want to protect, protect them because really full disk encryption doesn't do anything if someone just owns your machine. Um, but it also gets to a greater point of if we want to build secure networks, if you want to have a, a secure internet, uh, we can't do that unless we have endpoints that are secure. You can't build a, 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 a secure network without the foundations of the secure endpoints. But by and large, we figured out the disk encryption theory aspects of the stuff. We know how to generate random numbers reasonably securely on a computer. We know all the block cipher modes of operation that we should use for full disk encryption to get these sorts of uh, nice security properties. We know how to derive keys from passwords securely. So mission accomplished, right? We can all stand on an aircraft carrier and, you know. The answer is no, it's not the whole story. There's still a hell of a lot of cleanup that you need to do. Um, even if you have absolutely perfect cryptography, even if you know it can't be broken in any way, you still have to implement it on a real computer where you don't have these nice black box academic properties of your system. And so you don't attack the crypto when you're trying to break someone's full disk encryption. You either attack the computer and trick the user somehow, or you attack the user and convince them to either give you the password or get it from them in some other means by like a keylogger or whatever. And de facto, de facto use uh, doesn't really match up with the security uh, models of the full disk encryption software. If you're looking at full disk encryption software, they're very much focused on the disk theoretic uh, aspects of full disk encryption. And here's a, here's a quote from the, uh, the TrueCrypt 
uh, web page, their actual documentation, that they do not secure data on your computer if someone has ever manipulated it or is manipulating it while it's running. Like, I, I, I wish I was making this up. They're, they basically, their entire security model is like, oh, if it encrypts the disk correctly, if it decrypts the disk correctly, we've done our job. Woot. Um, and I apologize for the text that you probably would not be able to read very well. So I'll read it here, a little bit of it here. So we never, this is, this is a, an exchange between the TrueCrypt developers and uh, another security researcher by the name of Joanna Rutkosia. Um, where she brought up this attack and, and tried to talk to them and, and see what their reaction was to feasibility. And so this is, what, this is what they said. We never consider the feasibility of hardware attacks. We have to assume the worst. And she asks, do you carry your laptop with you all the time? They say, how the user ensures physical security is not our problem. And she asks very correctly, what, why in the world do I need encryption then? So we live in the, ignoring feasibility of an attack is just, it's, it's specious, you can't do that. Um, we, we live in the real world where we have these systems that we have to deal with, we have to implement them, we have to use them. And there's no way that you can compare a 10 minute attack that you can conduct with just software like a flash drive to something where you need to pull apart the hardware and uh, manipulate the system that way. And regardless of what they say, physical security and resistance to physical attack is in the scope of full disk encryption. It doesn't matter what you, what you disclaim in your security model. At the very least, if, if they don't want to claim responsibility of that, they need to be very clear and unequivocal about how easily this stuff can be broken. So um, this is a diagram of sort of an abstract system diagram of what, a, what is mostly in a, in a modern CPU um, or a modern computer. Uh, and sort of what the, what the boot process is, just so everyone's on the same page of what's, what actually happens here. So uh, as we know, the bootloader gets loaded from the secondary storage on the computer by the BIOS and it gets copied into main memory through, uh, you know, data transfer. The bootloader then asks the user for some sort of authentication credential, like a password or a, or a, key, or a key smart card or something like that. That password is then transformed by some process into a key which is then stored in memory for the duration of the computer being active. And then the bootloader of course transfers control over to the operating system and then both the operating system and the key remain in memory for the transparent encryption and decryption of the computer. This is a very idealized view. This assumes that nobody is trying to screw with this process in any way. And I think we can all think of a few different ways where this can be broken. So let's enumerate a few of the things that might go wrong if someone's trying to attack you. So I break attacks into three fundamental tiers. Non-invasive, which is something that you might be able to execute with just a flash drive. You don't even need to take the system apart. Or some other hardware component that you could attach to it, like a PCI card, uh, Express card, um, or Thunderbolt, uh, the new uh, adapter that gives you basically na naked access to the PCI bus. Secondly, we'll consider attacks where a screwdriver might be required, where you might need to remove some system component temporarily to deal with it in your own little environment. And also soldering iron attacks, which is the most complicated, where you're physically either adding or modifying system components like chips on the system in order to try to break these things. And so uh, one of the first types of attacks, uh, a compromised bootloader, or um, this is also sometimes known as an evil made attack, where the bootloader itself, since you need, to, you need to start executing some unencrypted code as part of the system boot process, um, something which you can bootstrap yourself with and prompt the user for credentials and, and then get into uh, access to the rest of the data that's encrypted on the hard drive. There's a few different ways that you could do this. Um, you could physically alter the bootloader on um, the storage system. You could, compromise main, you could compromise the BIOS, you could load a malicious BIOS that hooks the keyboard adapter or hooks the disk, uh, the disk reading routines and modify it that way in a way that's resistant to removing the hard drive. But I mean in any case, you can modify your, your, your system so it, when the user enters their password, it gets written to disk unencrypted or, or something like that. That in some way the attacker can get it. You could do something similar at the operating system level. Um, if, this is especially true if you're not uh, using uh, full disk encryption, if you're using container encryption. There's the whole operating system that someone could manipulate. This could also happen from uh, uh, an attack on the system like an exploit. So someone gets root on your box and now they can read the key out of main memory. Um, that's a perfectly legitimate attack. 
And then that key could be either trans stored on the hard drive in, in plain text for later uh, acquisition by the attack or, or sent over the network to their command and control systems. Another possibility, of course, is capturing the user input via keylogger, be it software, hardware, something exotic like a pinhole camera or maybe a microphone that records them typing in sounds and trying to figure out what, what keys they pressed. Um, this is kind of a hard attack to, to stop because it's, it potentially includes components that are outside of the system. I also want to talk about data remnants attacks, uh, more colloquially known as a cold boot attack. So if you asked five years ago, even people who are very security savvy, what are the data properties, what are the security properties of main memory, they would tell you when it powers down, you lose the data very, very quickly. Um, and then uh, an excellent paper from Princeton in 2008 uh, discovered that actually at room temperature, you're looking at several seconds of perfectly good, very, very little data degradation in RAM. And if you cool it down to cryogenic temperatures by, say, using an inverted uh, can duster, you can get several minutes where you're getting very, very little bit degradation in main memory. And so if your key's in main memory and someone pulls your modules out, and pulls out of your attack, uh, pulls, out, pulls out the modules from your computer, they can attack your key by finding where it is in main memory in the clear. Um, you can, and there's, there's, there's like some attempts for, for resolving this in hardware, like, oh, the memory modules need to be scrubbed and we're booting up. But it's not going to help you if someone takes the module out and puts it either in an, another computer or a dedicated piece of, of hardware for uh, extracting the memory module contents. And finally, uh, there's direct memory access. Any PCI device on your computer has the ability to, in ordinary operation, to read and write the contents of any sector in main memory. They can basically do anything. And I mean, this was designed back in when computers were, were much slower, where we didn't want to have the CPU babysitting every transfer from devices to and from main memory. So devices gain this direct memory access capability to just, they could be issued a command by the CPU and then they could just finish it and the data would be in memory whenever you needed it. And this is a problem because PCI devices can be reprogrammed. A lot of these things have writable firmware that you can just reflash to something hostile. And this could compromise the operating system or, or execute any one of any other form of attack of, of either modifying the OS or pulling out the key directly. Um, there's forensic capture hardware that is designed to do this in, uh, in criminal investigations. They like plug, plug something into your computer and uh, pull out the contents of memory. You can do this with Firewire. You can do this with the uh, Express Card. You can do this over Thunderbolt now, the new, the new Apple adapter. So these are basically external buses to your, to your, to your in, these are external ports to your internal system bus, which is very, very powerful. So wouldn't it be nice if we could keep our keys somewhere else in RAM? Because we've sort of demonstrated that RAM is not terribly trustworthy from the security perspective. Is there any dedicated uh, key storage or cryptographic hardware? And I mean, there is. You can find things like cryptographic accelerators. You use them in web servers so you can handle more SSL transactions per second. Um, and they're, you know, they're tamper resistant or, or certificate authorities have these things that hold their, their top secret keys. Um, but they're not really designed for uh, high throughput operations like using disk encryption. And so are there any other options? Can we use the CPU as sort of a pseudo uh, a, uh, hardware crypto module? So can we compute something like AES in the CPU using only something like CPU registers? Intel and AMD added these rather excellent uh, new CPU instructions, which actually take all the hard work of, of doing AES out of your hands. You can just do the block cipher primitive operations with just a single you know, assembly instruction. Um, the question is then, can we store, can we can we store our key in memory and can we actually perform this process without relying on main memory? We have a fairly lar large register set on x86 processors. I don't know if any of you have actually tried adding up all the, all the bits that you have in registers, but it's something like four kilobytes almost on modern CPUs. So some of it we can actually dedicate to, uh, to key storage and scratch space for uh, our encryption operations. One possibility is using uh, the hardware breakpoint debugging registers. There's four of these on, in your typical Intel CPU. And in 64-bit mode, these are each going to hold 64-bit pointer. 
So that's 256 bits of, of potential storage space that most people will never actually use. Uh, the advantage, of course, to uh, using debug registers is one, they're privileged registers, so only the operating system can access them, ring zero. Um, and you get other, we get other nice benefits, like uh, when the CPU is powered down, either by shutting off the system or putting it in sleep mode, you actually lose all register contents, so you can't cold boot these. Um, and uh, a guy in Germany, Thilo Mueller, actually implemented this thing as Tressor um, for Linux in 2011. And he did performance testing on it, and it's actually not any slower than doing your regular. Uh, AES computation and software. How about two, how about instead of storing a single key, though, we can store 228-bit keys? This sorts of get the sorts of this gets us into more of the crypto module space. We can store a single master key, which never leaves the CPU on on boot up, and then load and unload wrapped versions of keys as we need them for additional tasks task uh, operations. The problem is this: we, we can have our, our code and our, our keys stored outside of main memory, but the CPU is ultimately still going to be executing uh, the contents of memory. So a DMA transfer or some other manipulation could still alter the operating system and get it to dump out the registers, whether they be in main memory or if they're somewhere more exotic like debug registers. Can we do anything about the DMA attack angle? And as, a, as it turns out, yes, we can. Uh, in recently, as part of uh, new technologies for enhancing server virtualization, for performance reasons, people liked being able to attach, say, a network adapter to a virtual server. So it would need to go through a hypervisor. And so IOMMU technology was developed so you can actually sandbox a PCI device into its own little section of memory where it can't arbitrarily read and write anywhere on the system. So this is perfect. We can set up IOMMU permissions to protect our operating system or whatever we're using to handle keys and uh, protect it from arbitrary access. And again, our friend from Germany, Thilo Mueller, has implemented a version of Tressor on a, on a micro bitvisor called Bitvisor, which basically does this. Um, it lets you run a single operating system and it transparently does this disk access encryption. The guest doesn't even have to care or know anything about it, which is great. Uh, Disk access is totally transparent to the OS. Um, debug registers cannot be accessed by the OS. And IOMMU is set up so that the hypervisor itself is secure from manipulation. But as it turns out, there's kind of other things in memory that we might care about other than disk encryption keys. Um, we ran, there's sort of, there's the problem that, that, that I hinted at earlier where we do container, we used to do container encryption and now we all do full disk encryption for the most part. We do full disk encryption because it's very, very difficult to make sure you don't get accidental writes of your sensitive data to temporary files or caching in a container encryption system. Now that we're reevaluating re main memory as a secure, uh, as a not secure, not trustworthy place of storing data, we need to treat it in much the same way. We have to encrypt everything we want to leak. We do not want to leak. So things that are really important, like SSH keys, your private keys, your PGP keys, you have a password manager, or you know any top secret documents that you're working on. Um, so I had a very very silly notion: Can we encrypt main memory? or at least most of the main memory where we're likely to keep secrets so we can at least minimize how much we're going to leak. And once again, surprisingly, or perhaps not so surprisingly, the answer is again is yes. Um, a proof of concept in 2010 by a guy named Peter Peterson actually tried in implementing um, a, dis uh, a RAM encryption solution. So it wouldn't encrypt all of RAM. It would basically split uh, main memory into two components, a small fixed size clear which would be unencrypted, and then a larger sort of pseudo swap device where all the data was encrypted prior to being kept in main memory. Ended up being obviously quite a bit slower in uh, synthetic benchmarks with read performance more, more effective than write performance. But you know what? In the real world, when you ran like a web browser benchmark, it actually did pretty well. 10% slower. I think we can live with that. The problem with this proof of concept implementation, it was it stored the key to the crypt in main memory, because where else would we put it? The author considered uh, using things like the TPM for bulk encryption operations, but those things are even slower than dedicated hardware crypto systems, so it would just be totally unusable. 
But you know what? If we're using, if we have the capability to use the CPU as a sort of pseudo hardware crypto module, it's right in the center of things. So it should be actually be fast enough to do these things. So maybe we can actually use something like this. So let's say we have this, this sort of system set up. We've, get, we've gotten uh, our keys are not in main memory. Our code responsible for manipulating the keys is protected from arbitrary read and write access by malicious hardware components. Uh, main memory is encrypted, so most of our secrets are not going to leak even if someone tries to execute a cold boot attack. But how do we actually get a system booted up to this state? Because we need to start from a turned off system, authenticate ourselves to it, and get the system up and running. How do we do this in a trustworthy way? Because after all, someone could still modify the system software to, to trick us into thinking that we're running this great new system, but in reality, we're just not doing anything. So one of the very important topics is being able to verify the integrity of our computers. The user needs to be able to verify that their computer has not been tampered with before they authenticate themselves to it. And there's a, there's a tool that we can use for this, um, the trusted platform module. Um, it's kind of got a bad rap, but we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but it has the capability to measure your booting sequence in a couple of different ways uh, to let you control what data will be re revealed to the system from the TPM unless you're uh, in two, part two particular system configuration states. So you can basically seal data to a particular software configuration that you're running on your system. Uh, and there's a, couple of different, there's a couple of different implementation approaches to do this, and there's fancy cryptography to make it really hard to get around it. Um, so maybe we can do this. And so what is a TPM anyway? Um, it's, I mean, it was originally sort of like hailed as the, the grand solution to digital rights management by media companies. Um, media companies would be able to remotely uh, verify that your system is running in some approved configuration uh, before they would let you run the software and, and unlock the key to your video files. It ended up being really impractical in practice, and so we're not actually, nobody's actually even trying to use it for this purpose anymore. Um, I think a better way to think about it is really just a, a smart card that's fixed on your motherboard. Um, it can perform some cryptographic operations, RSA, SHA, has a random number generator, um, and it has physical attack countermeasures to prevent someone from very easily getting access to the data that's stored in it. The only real difference between it and a smart card is it has this ability to measure the system boot state into platform configuration registers. And it's usually a separate chip on the motherboard. Um, so there's some security implications of that. And there's some kind of fun bits, like uh, monotonic counters, uh, numbers that you can only uh, request the TPM increases, and then you can check what the value is. Um, there's a small non-volatile memory uh, range that you could use for, well, really whatever you want. It's not very big, like a kilobyte, but you know, it could be useful. There's a, t a tick counter, which uh, lets you determine how long the, the system has been running since last startup. And there's uh, commands that you could issue to the TPM to, do thing, to, let it, to, to make it do things on your behalf, which include even things like clearing itself if you feel the need to. So we want to then develop a protocol that a user can run against the computer that they can ver so that they can verify that the computer has not been tampered with before, that they, before they, they authenticate themselves to the computer and then begin using it. So what sort of things could we try sealing to platform configuration registers that would be useful for this sort of, uh, this sort of a protocol? And so a couple of suggestions that I have are uh, seeds to one-time password tokens, either of the time or the, the event variety. Maybe some sort of a unique image or animation, like a photograph of you somewhere. Um, something, that's, something that's difficult to, uh, something unique, that's not something you could, that someone could easily find uh, elsewhere. And then, say, disable the, uh, the video out in your computer when, when you're part in this, this uh, challenge response authentication mode. You also want to seal a part of the disk key, and there's a couple of reasons you want to do that. Um, it assures that the system, you know, within secure, certain security uh, assumptions, it assures that the system is only going to be booting into some approved software configuration that you control as the owner of the computer. And so ultimately, that means that the, anyone who wants to attack your system needs to do it either through breaking the TPM or they need to do it within the sandbox that you've created for them. 
Um, and this, this, of course, is not very cryptographically strong or anything like that. You're not going to have a protocol which uh, allows a user to authentic uh, securely authenticate the computer to the same level that you have, say, security in AES. But unless you can do something like RSA encryption in your head, it's never going to be perfect. So I mentioned that there's a self-erase TPM command that you can issue um, as in the software. And uh, since you're also running the system, since you're also uh, require the system to, the TPM requires the system to be in a particular configuration before it will release secrets, you can actually do something interesting, like self-destruct. Uh, if you develop the software and set up your, your, your protocol to limit, say, the number of times the computer has been started up unsuccessfully, um, have a timeout once the password, it's been waiting on the password screen for some period of time, or limit the number of password attempts that you can, you can enter, um, or the amount of time since the last, the computer has been started up, say if it's been in cold storage for a week or two. Um, you could also restrict access to the computer for periods of time. Say you know you're going to be traveling to a foreign country and you want to lock down your computer for the duration of the trip so when you get to your hotel or whatever on the other end, then you can unlock it, but not before. You can also do fun things like uh, leave little canaries on the disk which appear to contain the, the critical values for your policy but are really just tripwires um, and you're really just using the internal TPM values. You could also create a self-destruct password address code to uh, automatically issue this, this uh, reset command. And you know, since, since the two options that an attacker would have would be break the TPM or run your software, you can kind of make them play by these rules. And you can actually do an effective, uh, effective self-destruct. The TPM is intentionally designed to be very, very hard to copy. Um, you basically, you can't clone it very easily. Um, so you could use things like monotonic counters to detect write blockers, um, any disk restore or replay attacks. Um, and you know, once the TPM uh, clear command is issued, it's game over for an attacker who might want to get access to your data. There's some similarities to a system that uh, Jacob Applebaum uh, discussed at the Chaos Communication Congress many years ago, 2005. Uh, he proposed using a network, remote network server from, for many of these options. Um, but admitted it was going to be brittle and kind of potentially difficult to use. Since, since the TPM is an integrated system component, you can get a lot of these advantages by uh, using the TPM instead of a remote server. And a hybrid approach is potentially possible. You could have a, a system set up, say, as an IT department where you temporarily lock, lock down a system and it's only, it can only become available again once you plug it into the network, call your IT administrator, and they, they unlock the system again. Um, I'm kind of hesitant to expose a network stack this early in the boot process just because it massively increases your attack surface. But it's still a possibility. So I've sort of qualified all my statements that an attacker can only do this. Um, that's of course under the assumption that uh, they cannot break the TPM very easily. And so this is actually a uh, optical microscope scan of a TPM or smart card. Uh, done by Chris Tarnovsky, who spoke in here at DEF CON last year and then Black Hat a few years ago on the security of these TPMs. So he's actually done some really great work in figuring out how much, how hard these things are to break. Um, he's enumerated the countermeasures uh, and sort of figured out what would it take to actually break these, these things and actually has gone and done it and tested it. So there's things like light detectors, there's active meshes, there's all sorts of these really crazy circuit implementations to try to throw you off the track of what it's actually doing. Um, but if you spend enough time, you have enough resources, uh, and, you're, and you're careful enough, you can actually, uh, you can actually get around these, uh, you can actually get around most of these. So you can de-encapsulate a chip, put it in an electron microscope workstation, and, uh, you know, go wild. Um, find where the uh, unencrypted data bus is and just glitch it and get the thing to spill out all of its secret data. But nonetheless, uh, this sort of an attack, even if you've done all the R&D, is something that's going to take hours with an expensive microscope. And uh, you're still going to need to spend months of R&D to figure out what the countermeasures are on the chip so you can actually break it without frying the one chip of your attack target. There's also reset attacks. I mentioned earlier again that the TPM is a separate chip on the motherboard in almost all cases. 
It's very, very low in the system hierarchy. Um, it's not up in the CPU like it is, say, in, in for DRM enforcement in video game consoles. Um, if you manage to reset it, you're really not going to adversely affect the system that badly. Um, it's usually a chip that's off the uh, the LPC bus on the computer, which is itself is uh, sort of a, a legacy bus that's off the South Bridge or the platform platform hub. And on modern systems, really the only sorts of things you're going to find on here are the TPM and things like the BIOS, legacy keyboards. I mean, we used to have floppy controllers, but I guess not really anymore. Um, so if you and if you find a way to to reset, say the the low pin count bus, you'll reset the TPM into a, a fresh system boot state. Um, you'll lose your key, your PS2 keyboard, but not really a big deal. Uh, and you'll be able to re uh, to play back uh, the boot sequence of a trusted uh, a trusted boot sequence that, that the TPM has data sealed to, without actually executing that boot sequence, and then you could use this to extract data. Um, there's a couple of attacks that have tried to exploit this. Um, if you're using uh, an older mode in the TPM called static root for trust measurement, you can do this pretty easily. Um, I have not seen any research on a successful attack against the newer Intel Trust execu Execution Technology version of the TPM ac activation. It's likely still possible. Um, so this is, this is an area that, that, that probably needs more research to uh, intercept the LPC bus and what it's communicating to the CPU. So that might be another way that you can attack the TPM. And so let's uh, let's uh, look at a blueprint. What I think we should have for uh, uh, for getting the system up from a cold boot state up into what we have our run our running trustworthy configuration. There's a lot of really vulnerable legacy system components in our PC architecture. Um, you can do all sorts of things in the BIOS, like hooking the interrupt vector table and modifying disk read and writes, or capturing keyboard input or screwing with the system in all sorts of fun different ways, masking out CPU feature registers. I mean, there's plenty of options if you want to mess with people. And so my, I'm, in my opinion, you really want to get out of bias controlled mode, out of real mode into protected mode as soon as possible, uh, and really just, just do your measurement stuff. Um, so once you get into, into this pre-boot mode, which is really just your operating system, like a, a Linux initial RAM disk, then you start executing your protocol and start doing these things. Um, because, I mean, once you're, once you're using operating system resources, what someone does to, at the BIOS level as far as interrupt tables doesn't really affect you anymore. You really don't care. Um, and you can do sanity checks on your registers. Like, if you know you're running on a core i5, you know it's going to be supporting things like no execute bit and debug registers and other stuff that people might try to max, max out, max, mask out in capability registers. So here's the runtime blueprint. Uh, what we actually want the system, uh, what we actually want the system to look like once we're in the running configuration. Um, it, so there was the previous project, Trevisor, which implemented many of the uh, security aspects of doing disk encryption using CPU registers and having IO MMU protections on your main memory. The problem is that uh, Bitvisor is a very specialty, not very commonly used program. Uh, Zen is sort of like the canonical open source hypervisor where there's a lot of security research going on. People are making sure it's not broken. Um, and so in my opinion, we should use something like Zen as your bare level hardware, uh, your hardware interface. And then use a, like a Linux uh, DOM0 uh, administrative domain on, uh, on it to actually do your hardware initial initialization. So uh, again, uh, in, in, in Zen, all of your para-virtualized domains are actually running in non-privileged mode in ring three. So they don't actually have direct access to things like uh, the debug registers. So that's, that's one thing that's already done. Uh, Zen exposes things like hypercalls that, that give you access to those sort of stuff. But you know, it's, it's something you can disable in software. Uh, and so the approach I'm taking is we'll sort of do that master key approach in, uh, in, in uh, the debug registers. We'll dedicate two debug registers, the first two, to store a 128-bit AES key, which is our master key. This thing never leaves the CPU registers as soon as it's entered in by the process with, that takes the user credentials. And then we use uh, the second two uh, registers as virtual machine-specific whatevers. It could be either as ordinary debug registers or, um, in this case, we could use it to encrypt main, main memory. 
Um, in this particular case, we still need to have a few devices that are directly connected to the administrative domain. That includes the graphics processing unit, which is a PCI device, um, you know, the keyboard, the TPM, all this stuff needs to be directly accessible. So you can't really apply IMMU protections on this. But things like the network controller, the storage controller, arbitrary devices in the PCI bus, you can set up IOMMU protections on it so they'd have absolutely zero access to your administrative domain or your hypervisor memory spaces. You can do similar things by create, uh, you, can, you can get access to things like the network by actually putting things like your network controller into uh, dedicated virtual machines. So these things are, these things get the devices mapped but have IOMMU protection set up so that device can only access the memory space of this virtual machine. You can do the same thing with your storage controller. And then you actually run all of your applications in virtual machines that have absolutely zero direct hardware access. So even if someone owns your web browser or sends you a malicious PDF file, they don't actually get anything that would let them seriously compromise your disk encryption. So I can't take the credit for that, that architecture design. It was actually uh, the base, it was actually the, the design basis for a really excellent project called the Cubes OS project. Um, they basically describe themselves as a pragmatic formulation of Zen and Linux and a few custom tools to basically do a lot of the stuff I just talked about. Um, implement so, uh, these non-privileged guests uh, and do a nice unified system environment. So it feels like you're really running with one system, but it's actually a bunch of different virtual machines under the hood. So I use this as the implementation of my code base. Um, all the encryptions, all the crypto stuff is stuff that I've added on top of it. And so the tool I'm releasing, um, this is still really proof of concept experimental code. I call it Phalanx. Um, it is a patch to Zen to do the uh, implementation of the disk encryption stuff as I've described. Um, master key in the first two debug registers, second two debug registers, totally unrestricted. Um, for security reasons, uh, the XMM registers which are used as scratch space are encrypted as well as the, uh, the key when you're doing some VM context switches. And I've also implemented a very, very simple implementation of the crypt, crypt keeper paper, the encrypted memory, uh, using ZRAM. Because hey, it's been mainlined, it does pretty much everything except crypto, so adding encryption on top of it is just a really tiny little bit of code, which is great. The most secure code is the code you don't have to write, right? Uh, and so it's, uh, the nice thing about, about ZRAM is it gives you a bunch of the, the, the bits that you need to securely implement things like AES counter mode, which is really great. Um, hardware wise, uh, you do have a, uh, you do have uh, a, few, a few system requirements. So you need a, CP, uh, a system that supports the uh, AES new instructions. Uh, reasonably common, but not every system has it. Um, chances are if you have an Intel i5 or i7, almost all of them support it. But there are some oddballs, so um, check out like Intel Arc to make sure it supports all the features that you need. Um, ditto hardware virtualization extensions. These are very, very common as of like 2006. Um, IOMMU is a little bit more complicated to find if you're looking for a computer. Um, it's not listed as a sticker specification. You kind of need to dig for it. And there's a lot of people who should know better uh, but don't about what the difference is between VTX and VTD and so forth. Um, so you might need to hunt for a system that supports this stuff. And you want a system, of course, with a TPM because otherwise you can't implement this measured boot thing at all. Um, so usually you'll want to be looking at like business class machines where you can verify this sort of stuff exists. Um, if you look for like Intel TXT, it'll, it'll have almost everything you need. Um, the Cubes team actually keeps a really great hardware compatibility list on their uh, wiki, which actually has details for a lot of systems that, that do this sort of stuff. So uh, security assumptions. In order for the system to be secure, uh, we have a few assumptions about a few of the system components. The TPM, of course, very, very critical component uh, for assuring the uh, integrity of the boot. We need to make sure that there's no backdoor capable of dumping NVRAM or manipulating monotonic counters or putting the, CP or putting the system into a state where it's not actually trusted, we just think it is, by, say, resetting the PCR attacks. And uh, based on remarks by uh, Tarnovsky, who has reverse engineered these chips, um, I'm sort of setting a, 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 uh, a bound of roughly 12 hours of, ac uh, of exclusive access to the computers required if you want to do a TPM attack on it to pull out secrets. 
there's a few assumptions about the CPU, the memory controller, and IOMMU, mainly that they're not backdoored and there's, they're correctly implemented. Um, some of these might not necessarily be very strong assumptions because Intel could very easily backdoor some of these things and we have no way of finding out. And some like, security assumptions about Zen. It, as a piece of software, it actually has a very good security record, but, you know, nothing's perfect and occasionally there are security vulnerabilities. In the case of Zen, given its pri privileged position in the system, that's actually kind of a big deal. You really want to make sure it's secure. And so under those security assumptions, we have, uh, you know, let's sort of put a framework up for a threat model. We want to do a realistic threat assess assessment where we realize, where we realize that not every system is unbreakable, um, especially when there's so many legacy components that were designed without any consideration of security. But at the same time also that not all, not all theoretical attacks are practical and you can't lump uh, very, very simple attacks with, with a difficult complex uh, hardware attacks. And I think a good analogy is thinking about safe security. We all know that every safe can eventually be broken. It's a question of how much time you have to reverse engineer it and how much time you have to, have to break it. But eventually it can be broken. And so I think we need to think about our systems in the context of having physical security defenses in terms of hours rather than minutes that we have right now. And as always, if I've screwed up, if I've made an assumption that you don't think holds, prove it, verify it, verify mine, make sure I'm right or wrong. And so expected security, these is, this is what you'll actually get. Cold boot attack is not going to be effective, period, against keys. And stuff that you have in main memory is going to be restricted by whatever you have in clear. Um, Hardware-based RAM acquisition is not going to be effective because they're going to be IOMMU sandboxed to nothing, so they're not actually going to get your application state or your system state. Um, and even if you manage to extract the secrets out of a TPM, all it's going to do is get you back to where we are right now, where although it is easily broken, you're still not all the way down to zero. And I sort of am setting an assumption here that if, if you have a good security habit policy, where, which is reasonable, say 12 hours of no contact with your computer, you should be okay. As long as you're vi reasonably vigilant and not excessively vigilant, you should be okay. Um, a couple of attack methods which are, which are really like, these are the main ones that I would attack if I were trying to uh, break into a system that used something like this. Key loggers and, and friends are still going to be uh, very much not defended against. You can do some mitigation of this by using one-time tokens, but it's still, again, you're going to be imperfect. Uh, TPM attacks, as mentioned before, either NVRAM extraction or LPC bus uh, reset intercept hardware. Um, find some way of tricking the TPM into getting into a configuration that it thinks is, is trustworthy but is actually not. Um, and RAM manipulation. If you have something which looks like RAM, quacks like RAM, acts like RAM, but isn't actually RAM, it pretends to be RAM for most of the time but lets you manipulate it externally, then there's really nothing you can do because you'd be able to manipulate the, the, the contents of the system no problem. Um, you could also try things like a transient pulse injection, which is how George Hotz broke the hypervisor security on the PS3. Um, a little quick bit about legal notes. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, not your lawyer, not legal advice. Um, as far as I know, if you have, okay, if you have uh, self-destruct, as far as I know, it is not illegal yet. But there has been no legal test case of this. Might be interesting to find out. Um, but I'm not sure I'd want to be that test case either. Um, it, but you also need to be aware that TPM and strong encryption is not, uh, not it's, it's illegal in certain jurisdictions. You can't use a TPM in, say, China. You can't use a TPM in Russia. Um, and some companies like the United, or countries like the United Kingdom have mandatory key disclosure. You will go to prison if you do not hand over a key, like the RIPA Act. Um, future work and improvements, uh, production version, uh, stable version. Right now it is not stable. Um, if you put your computer to sleep, it will eat your data, among a couple of other problems. <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, and there's some other things that might be fun to do in the future, like, uh, you know, open SSL keys are really important. So if there's some API that you could do to um, uh, basically let you swap out your, your contents of memory very, very quickly so your exposure time is very small. Um, something easily install while well, you guys could all install um, and maybe upstream the patches to Linux and Zen and the goons are getting ready to kick me off the stage. Uh, conclusions. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Um, so best security in the world goes unused if it's unusable. Um, the model needs to account for realistic use patterns. And it's not just disk encryption. It's you really need to think about it holistically from the perspective of the whole system. 
Um, and it's challenging to do, do this, but I think it's possible and we should try. Thank you.